So last week we we worked one through five, um, the first passage there. If you're you're looking at scripture, if you're thinking about how to read scripture, um, a mistake that we often make is that we read a verse. Uh, it sounds wrong to say it's a bad thing to read a verse, uh, but you know when you understand what I mean. When we read just a verse, it's very easy to take it out of context. There are some verses in what we're going to read this morning that would be very easy that if you just took it on its own to build something that would be incorrect, uh, a wrong way of thinking about what everything else is. Um, we see it every day when we hear about what somebody says, uh, what somebody does uh, in politics or celebrities. You hear, this person said this. And the first thing I want to do is go and watch the actual video of the person saying it so that I can see what happened before and after. So I can understand why did the person say that? What are, the, what are they talking about? And was it just clipped out of the sentence? Context, <coughs> understanding what is around it, why it's being said and how it's being said uh, is very important. Um, if I come into this room and I quietly tell you something in a real calm, it's very different than if I come in and start shouting and screaming it, the context of understanding how things are being talked about is as important as the, the content. So when we read it, it's important to go back a little bit to think through, and it's also important to understand this basic structure of the paragraph, or the thought, the, the block of thinking, so that you can get it together as one idea. Um, I've said it before, I'll say it again. It's uh, instead of pearls, that you take one pearl out and you look at it and you admire it and you put it back... It's like links on a chain where they all connect. Uh, I've kind of gotten to more of a thinking about it like a chain link fence where it's not just connected to the one next to it, it's connected to the whole thing. Uh, maybe chain mail. Chain mail seems more you know, elegant. And, you know, chain link fence, I don't know. That, I don't know. I, we'll go with mail like a knight. Uh, but let's, uh, let's jump into verse 6 and we'll read through verse 10. It says, let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would, Lord, you would apply these words, or that you have preserved and inspired, or you would apply them to our hearts, to our minds, or to, to the most inner part of who we are. Or that through the Holy Spirit you would interpret them into our our own lives, so we can understand what it means. Where we wouldn't be hearers only, but we would be doers. Lord, I pray that you would use this time that we have, Lord, to change Lord, who we are for the better, not just of ourselves, but for the better of this world. Lord, I thank you for it. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. So the, the first verse here is a little bit uncomfortable for me. Um, I, it's kind of weird. Let the one, let's see, let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. So that makes me feel uncomfortable telling you that. Uh, hey, give me stuff. Share with me. Um, I don't think necessarily that it's, uh, it's the way that we think of it now. Uh, because at the time, you wouldn't have had just uh, pastors. You, know, you wouldn't have had a, a church with a pastor that was run the way that we run things uh, with a salary or anything like that, you would have mostly had guys like Paul that were going around to different areas of the, the Mediterranean at the time, uh, and they would be sharing what was going on. Uh, think about when Jesus sent out his uh, disciples. What did he say? Don't take anything with you, because the, the one that's going out is worthy of his, you know, his food or whatever. He's like, go out and do the things that you're going to be doing, and people will take care of you. It's a way of showing that the church that is ultimately growing here is going to take care of one another. We see this as we back up. It's the same idea that we are to care for one another. We're to take care of one another. Um, it's also this idea that gets fleshed out more and more. 
the stuff that we have, the, the things that we, we own, we are to hang on to them with a, a very loose hand. Uh, there's supposed to be uh, a clear line of delineation between who we are and who the world is. And one of the ways that it is made evident is by the way we treat our things, by the way we treat our money and our, our, our houses, and our, our resources, you know, whatever you want to call that. Um, the way that we think about those things, it's different than the way the world thinks about it. Um, if we treat our stuff as ultimate, then there's something disconnected in our relationship with the Father. If we treat our, our homes as like our, our fortress that no one can come in and it's just for us and just stay away, there's something wrong about the way that we're thinking about it. Our homes are to be something that we, we share with one another, especially. But they're a resource to be exploited for the kingdom. And not just that we're like, hey, you know, whoever's swinging by, just, you know, and whatever homeless guy happens to be cruising by that day, come in. I understand we're not, not saying that. But it's something that we are to use our homes in hospitality towards one another. We're to use our, our stuff in a way that glorifies the kingdom, not our own lives. That is very, very different than the way the world looks at stuff. Uh, the way the world looks at money is different. It doesn't make any sense for us to come in here and pass a plate around and for you to put money in it. Especially if you're not getting anything for that, right? Uh, a lot of times we look at it as, you know, I'm paying to keep the lights on or I'm paying to do this or I'm paying to do that. And I hope that, you know, we understand those things have to happen. You have to have lights. I guess we could probably turn off the lights and still be okay. Uh, we probably have to have a microphone because my voice is quiet, so you might not be able to hear it very well. But, uh, you know, we could, we could do without things, you know, to a certain extent. Um, but that's not the ultimate reason that we give. The ultimate reason that we give our, our stuff, our money, is because we want to demonstrate to God that we understand who it belongs to. That we understand what this life really ultimately is. That it's not just a thing where we gather as much as we can and we hang on to it with everything we've got and then we die. The end. And somebody else gets all our stuff. Hopefully our kids were nice and they get it and whatever. Uh, like that's, it's good to have things. It's not a bad thing. But if that's ultimate, if that's your goal in life, if every thought that you have is a move forward of how you can accumulate more, get more, get a better job to have more. If every goal that you have is just bigger, better, faster, more, it's demonstrating that the, the anchor in your life, I guess, if you understand what I mean, the core of your being, who you are, is aligned with something different. It's not aligned with the kingdom of God. Uh, if you just simply watch or read uh, the life of Jesus, how he lived. It's completely counterintuitive to the way that we think about things. If you watch the way that he sent his disciples out, if you watch the way that they lived, I mean, it's, it's different. Uh, we, we have to be able to separate our relationship with Christ from our relationship with culture. And that's hard because you know where you are every day? In culture. We live in the culture that we live in every minute of every day. Uh, I've lived in different places. Uh, I never, ever, I'm serious. I'm not trying to be funny or anything like that. I never in a million years would have thought that I would live in the country, period. <coughs> but especially, like, we're not just out in a small town. We're outside of the small town. Like, we're, we're our own little island out here. Uh, and I really do love it. But it's its own kind of culture. You have to know how to learn, live within the rhythms of that culture. If you go into a big city, you have to understand the rhythms of how that works. You've got to understand how your neighbors are going to think and stuff. Uh, when we lived in Texas, we lived in a very affluent, uh, you call that upper class, you know, everybody worked for oil and had tons of money. We stayed in this 13,000 square foot house one time. The next door neighbors had an observatory on their top of their house, like not, you know, you could go to it, but like they had an observatory with a giant telescope at their house. 
like think about those things. Uh, there was a way that you had to work within and understand that culture. It wasn't always good. But there's something about that all the time, and you intrinsically know how it works. It's nobody has to tell you how to talk to the guy at the gas station. It's just there. You know that. So we have to understand that within our own culture, there's something that's oftentimes within Christianity, following Christ, that is going to be in you know, contention with that culture, with who we are. That ultimately, he didn't just call us to be the best you know, version of whatever we were. He's called us to be his. So when he's laying this point out, he's not just saying like, hey, make sure you pay the people that are teaching you well. That would be self-serving for me to say. But uh, that's not what he's saying here. What he's saying is, treat your stuff the way that you should be treating it. Think about those that are coming to you, and when they teach you the word, whether it's the pastor or just the, some guy, you know, whatever. Uh, <coughs> spend a lot of time thinking about who that some guy should be. But as that person teaches you, treat that that he's giving you as something that is valuable. That it's not simply just words that somebody's saying so that you can think about stuff. That the words of God hold weight and have value. It's not trivial. We live in a world of triviality. I mean, realistically, we have people that spend millions or probably billions of dollars on Super Bowl stuff, right? And we understand how trivial that is. I, I didn't realize how big of a thing it was now to bet on sports. I guess it's always been a thing. But now there's the internet and cell phones, so everybody does it all the time. Uh, like, it's, it's trivial stuff, right? It's something that's here today and gone tomorrow. He's wanting us to understand what the nature of this thing is. I think that's been the core of the book of Galatians, is understanding that this isn't this church thing, this Christianity, this understanding of the relationship with God is not something to be taken lightly. It's not an add-on to our lives. It is our lives. That's why the, the way that it's laid out is you were dead and now you're alive, that he, he gave you a new heart. Like if, if I took your heart out of your chest, I don't plan on doing this, but if I did, what would happen to you? If anybody watched Indiana Jones, I remember the Kale you know that kind of thing. The guy died. Like he didn't keep on living. He did for a minute, which was super weird. But if you take the heart out, you're dead. When you put a new heart in, like we do that now, and it creeps me out. The guy that did Amelia's heart surgery when she was little had come from doing a heart transplant on a like a two month old or something ridiculous. And you know, the heart's like this. Like that's something that we can do. It's a giving of life. It's an understanding that the core of who you are is now different. He wants us to understand that that's what this is. It's not a religion. It's not adding more to it. It's a complete new thing. So as we go through the rest of this passage, consider it in that context. It says in verse 7, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. Um, we had a garden last summer. And... I did not enjoy that. <laughs> I'm just being <laughs> transparent. Uh, I thought, like, I was really amped up about this whole garden thing. And I was I was thinking, you know, I'm going to enjoy going out there every day and, you know, feeling like a farmer and doing all this. And then I did it for, like, one day. I was like, this is stupid. Uh, unless candy is coming out of the ground, I don't want to do it ever again. Um, <laughs> but when you put seeds in the ground, what happens? If I put okra down the ground, and then I wait a few days, what pops out of the ground? Okra. Okra. Every time. If I put some, I don't know, green beans down, or, you know, quinoa, I don't know why that popped into my head, but just, if I, whatever I put in the ground, that's what pops up, along with a whole bunch of weeds that you have to <laughs> kill, um, and bugs. Bugs are spawned from seeds, I believe. But uh, as you consider this, it's like you understand intrinsically how this works. I think most of us that live out in the country and see crops and farms and all that stuff, we get it even more than the other people. Because you see it, you understand. When they put the stuff in this field over here that's across from my house, they're probably going to plant cotton or corn. I don't know which one they're going to do this year. But when they go through and they seed that, in a few weeks, what do you see? Cotton. 
corn. Like you know what's happening. You're doing soybeans, you see it go in. You know what to expect is coming out. What he's saying is it would be insane for you to believe that I'm going to go and plant a whole bunch of corn and that jelly beans are going to come out of it, right? Or I'm going to go plant corn and tobacco is going to grow up. Like it would be like you're crazy if you think that that's how things are going to work. If, if I go over to this field and I start sticking things in the ground just like paper clips and, you know, more dirt, I don't know, just weird stuff down on the ground, and I stand there and water it and they expect for it to grow into a beautiful crop, what am I doing? How many of you would be like, hey, we need to have a meeting <laughs> like this week because uh, Austin's gone insane. Like, you would understand that it's not a normal thing. What he's equating this with is the same way that our life is. If you're constantly sowing to your own life, if you're constantly sowing to yourself, if everything you do is putting up for what you want to have more of later, then that's ultimately what's going to come out of your life, right? If we continue to sow in a selfish way, then we would not expect for love and giving to like come out of it on the other side of it. If we're constantly putting in, in a selfish thing, then self is what's going to come out. He, he fleshes this out more and more. But I like that he says that you, know, like, you should not be deceived. He says God isn't mocked. God isn't going to just take your... I have conversations with people a lot of times. And, and I have conversations with myself. Is that too weird to say? But it's true. We all do that, I guess. Uh, you know, 30% of people don't have an inner monologue. Does anybody in here not have an inner monologue? Like a voice that is you talk to in here. This isn't going to sound too crazy and just saying it. Like, you know, you don't say it out loud, but you just have more, you know, like, sounds. I don't know. I'm just going to hide here for a minute. Um, but, like, as you consider these things, as you think through it, he's, he's laying out, like, God doesn't mock. Whatever one sows, that is what you're going to reap. So it's coming right back out. Uh, as you consider these things, we need to understand that that's, that's the point. Like, what you're putting out into the ground, what you're putting out in your life, where you're hiding your treasure, like, ultimately, that's what you're going to reap. God is not going to be mocked in that way. Uh, he's not going to take your stuff that is wrong and just magically turn it into right. Uh, I have felt this... In my own life, and I, you know, I understand people constantly feel this way, but they want God to just change them into being something different, like magically overnight. Have you ever, I've prayed that. Have there ever been things I'm like, God, if you just would stop me from doing this. I remember I, I grew up, I cussed I like really bad all the time because of my upbringing and where I was. And uh, I, I would pray about it. I, I put the rubber band on my wrist and pop myself. I did all kinds of stuff to try to eliminate that thing that I saw as the like the, the most worst thing I could do was just this constant torrent of foul language all the time. And uh, I remember praying all the time, God would just like make me not do that anymore. And I, I felt like that was how God worked. It was just I was gonna continue to listen to and watch what I was doing and continue to be all around, you know, people that I was around. But then somehow he was just gonna click my language into a different way didn't work. I don't think it ever works. Maybe sometimes. I've heard of people speaking other languages. Uh, I don't know if they cuss in those other languages, but I doubt it. Um, but as you consider that, as you think about it, and you just think, I want God to make me do this thing. I don't think that that's how it works. <coughs> I think that there's something about who we are and what we do, the choices that we make. I think the prayer that I have learned to pray more and more, is God, would you help me to see you for who you are? To understand who you are, your value and your worth. Would you, there are going to be times, overcome my stupidity. But ultimately, would you give me an understanding of who you are so that it changes what I want, the, the core of who I am? That's kind of the point. God's not going to be mocked and if I continue to just, let's say it's cussing, and I just fill my mind with those words constantly, just in what I watch and what I listen to, 
And then I'm like, God, would you just take it away from me? Just, you know, I, I come and I'm down to the altar and I pray about it and all these things. Like, what am I doing? Like, I'm, in a way, I'm kind of mocking God, right? I'm sowing things in my own life, in my own heart, and then asking him to turn it into something else. It's like if you go to, uh, there's no CC's Pizza here, is there? Anyone ever been to CC's Pizza? It's like, or Golden Corral, maybe that's a better if you go to Golden Corral and you load your plate up and you hold it under the chocolate fountain, like the, the chicken, everything just like you just gone it up, it's crazy. And then you sit down and you're like, wait, hold on, we need to pray. And you ask God, like, would you please use this for the nourishment of my body? <laughs> what are you expecting to happen there? <laughs> I'm gonna eat these Cheetos and expect it to turn into carrots, because they look they're orange, you know, they're like <laughs> We understand intrinsically how this is. What we constantly put in is going to lead to health or unhealth, right? We understand this. And he's saying that that's how your life is. You are going to be more like what you're constantly going towards. God's not going to be mocked. He says in verse 8, For the one who sows to his own flesh will from his flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. That's such a, that word corruption is a weird, gross word. Uh, I, don't, I don't really care for it. Uh, there's six of us in my family, and so our refrigerator goes from groceries to leftovers to corruption uh, pretty quickly. <laughs> And uh, I, if you're used to that, I, I, I completely understand it. Sometimes you open something up and you're like, I'm just throwing that whole thing away. Uh, I've thrown away a lot of Rubbermaids and Tupperware and stuff because I start cleaning it out. I'm like, I can't, I can't even do that. I grew up in a junkyard and there's some smells that come out of that refrigerator that don't even hold a candle. Uh, I can't, I just can't do it. Uh, and Natalie conveniently has always been very sensitive to smells. So... It's, it's, it's going to be an excuse. Um, so it's when she wonders where the Tupperware goes, it's in the garbage. Um, but like when you understand that, you see it like this beautiful food that you just cooked and was very delicious. After a couple weeks, <laughs> it turns into something that is not what you want. Nobody's going to take it and throw it in the microwave and be like, yes, this is party time. It's corruption. It's turned into something that's gross. He's saying that if you're constantly sowing to your own flesh, you're sowing to your own corruption. You're, you're sowing in a way that is just more and more selfishness, more and more me, me, me. The, the core of my life and my heart and who I am is me. And he wants us to understand that if you remain in that place, if you continuously live that way, it's corruption, it's gross. It's going to turn into something you really... My father-in-law calls it the creeping corruption. Like when you get a, a really bad sickness or cough or whatever. It turns into that real quick. We need to understand what the, the opposite of this is not doing better and being nicer. What does he say? That you sow to the Spirit. This isn't about self-help. I know it sounds more like that than what we usually talk about. But he's not laying out a plan for you to live a better life. He's laying out a plan for you to understand that you have been given a new life. If you are his. That you are his from your bank account to your bedroom to your, your uh, kitchen to your car to your job to your family, to your extended family, to your hopes, to your dreams, to your politics, to your country, to your, your everything. From the bottom of your feet to the top of your head, everything is his. Everything is his. We cannot withhold anything from him and expect for him to be glorified and honored by our life. He wants us to get it over and over again. And this is not something obviously, that you get one time and then you're good for the rest of your life. Has anything in your life ever worked that way? <laughs> no. Not even a little bit, right? That's just not who we are. It's not a switch that flips on in your brain and then you're just good for life. 
is something that we constantly are going to have to turn our attention back towards the Spirit. Turn our, our heart and our mind and our, our stuff back to ask for forgiveness whenever we're going off track and looking towards the wrong thing. And it's not just as simple as the fruits that are coming out of the life. It's the core that those fruits are growing out of. We have to take much better care to think about who we are. Not so much always about what we do. It's about the who we are. So he's laying out this idea. He says, if you're, you're constantly sowing to your own flesh, it's corruption. Uh, that if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life. He says, and let us not grow weary of doing good. In verse 9, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. I think in the King James, if you have that in front of you, I think it says, if we don't faint, which I think is super cool. I like that uh, translation of it a little bit. Um, mostly because when I was in the garden and I was doing stuff, there were times where I'm like, ah, I think I might faint because it's hot and I hate doing this. And maybe if I lay down in the garden and pretend to be fainting, now they won't make me do this anymore. Um, didn't work. Uh, but uh, what he's laying out here is this idea, like, it's not just in how you start this. It's not in a, uh, you know, well, you know, yesterday I did really good, so I'm good for the week. Or uh, I think sometimes people consider it in like a, a balance, you know. I've done a lot of stuff, so I'm like banking up my good stuff so I can do the thing that I really want to do. You see the problem in that. It's not just that you're, you know, weighing things out as if you have some way to, you know, give more than he has already given. It's that in your heart... You're doing something in order to be able to do what you really want to do. And if it's what you really want to do and it's not his, it's wrong. That, that's the core of who you are. That's why I think we have to consider this. And on the day when we're going to do uh, Lord's Table, it's really important to consider this of who you actually are. What do you really want? Not the thing that when somebody asks you, especially somebody like me, uh, hey, what do you really want? Like, what's supposed to be really big in your life? What, you know, well, obviously, you just want all the orphans in the whole world to have homes and, you know, all the bald people to have hair and all the, you know, like, I don't know why that popped in my mind. Just like all the things to have the other things and just, like, what do you really want? At the core of who you are, what are you after? What are you about? That is really, really important. We can put out a good show of things, right? I know I can. I can pretend to be all sorts of things. I grew up, my family, uh, I would, my, my parents were divorced when I was a year old, so I never knew anything of just one family. I always knew that there was a way that you behaved here, and there was a way that you behaved here. There were things you could get away with over here, and there were things that you could get away with over here. There were things that were going to get you in big trouble with this parent and their sphere. There were things that that didn't even matter over here. And I learned how to really quickly keep that all in my mind as a little kid. We all do that to an extent. You know how to act around certain people. You know what the front is that you have to place out there. And what I'm going to say is a little bit weird, but the church is not the place for that. If you come to church and you're putting out a front of who you are, like, number one, everybody knows. We all pretend with one another that we're this certain thing or that certain thing, but we, deep down in our guts, we know who we really are. We can be real with one another. We can be honest. Who you are at the core of your very being it's worth taking the time to think through. It's worth taking the time to turn away from all the other stuff in this world that distracts you and just quietly contemplate, well, what am I really about? It's uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's very uncomfortable. But it's worth it. And I think that the prayer that we, we pray when we come to this is not, Lord, would you just magically make me this other thing? It's, Lord, would you help me to see in the core of who I am, you. That I would understand more and more every day that my life is not my own, that the, the way that I come into your presence and please you is not by my, 
my work or my effort. It's by your son, by what you have done for me. That at the core of my being, I am one who needs, not one who provides. That's hard. That's a difficult thing for us to really think through. What he's, the author here is, is really laying out for us to understand is that this isn't a, it's not a religious duty type of thing. It's not a religious thing at all. It's not you, by, by your own efforts, attempting to tie yourself to God, to lash yourself to Him. It's you understanding that, that He's done everything for you, that He's desired a relationship with you, that when we pray and we seek Him, that He actually wants to hear us. He loves to talk to us. That when we change our will to be more in line with him, that's what he ultimately wants. He wants the core of who we are to be his. Not just the fruit, not just the stuff, not just the clean yourself up. He wants who you are in your very heart, your guts, your being to be his. Let's move on. Uh, so then let us not grow weary. Uh, doing good for in due season we will reap if we do not give up so then as we have opportunity let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are the household of faith he brings us all together back uh, to the point of as you go through this life like take care of people he says do good to everyone and I think that if you just stop there like that's okay that, that sounds good but then he makes this special statement about especially those that are of the household of faith. He's once again laying out like, we are blessed to be a blessing in this world. We have been given so much. And we have been told to go out in the world and use that for others' good. To demonstrate a love for this world, the people of this world, through what we do and how we use our stuff and all of that ultimately so that we can share the gospel with them. But he, he adds this little caveat on the end of that. He says, especially those that are of the household of faith. He said that there is a special relationship here. And I don't just mean at Ebenezer. I mean like the, the church universal, those that are followers of Christ, that there is a special thing about that that we should have an affinity towards one another. That when we consider Sunday morning and we get to think about, uh, I'm going to go to church, I'm going to do it. Like, if it's a chore to you and you really don't want to do it, don't do it. You're going to miss out on what it is entirely anyways. He's calling us not just to love him and like be okay with it, but to love one another. To understand that we need one another. If you can go through this life and do it all on your own and just be fine, I think you've missed the point entirely. And honestly, I'll just be realistic. Not because I want you to show up or don't want you to show up or anything like that, but I feel sorry for you. Because you're missing the point of what this is. It's not just get your butt in the seat because God's going to be mad if you don't. Get your butt in the seat so God can clean you up a little bit more today. Or you can feel guilty and then feel better. Or, you know, catharsis or anything like that. It's you literally need other followers of Christ in your life. He has given us to one another. To love one another. To demonstrate something that is completely counterculture in this world. <laughs> an undying and an undeserved, uh, without bounds or borders or boundaries or whatever, a love towards one another that isn't based on a reciprocation of love. It's not based on you getting something back from it. A love for one another that goes beyond everything else. It's a demonstration of who Christ is and what he's done for us. That's what we're supposed to be is this microcosm of that picture of what God has done for us. The way that he has loved us is the way that we are to love one another. So when we offend one another, what do we do? We quickly forgive. We quickly seek forgiveness. When one of us needs something, it shouldn't be a thing where someone feels weird or guilty because they are the needy one. We should be quickly looking to fulfill needs for others in this congregation and in the church at large. 
We should be loving each other in such a way that it draws people from this world to see something that they don't understand. It should not make sense to them. If what we do makes sense to this world, then we are doing it incorrectly. It has no power. It has no purpose. It's just another corporate thing where you can gather together and do stuff. What we do when we gather together as his people, what we do as we are his people, as we go throughout this world, whether that's in your home or at this building or at the park or at the Tom Cumberland Farms uh, or at Dollar General, you know, whatever. When you are together, when you are see each other, if you are going through Dollar General and you see a fellow believer or someone from your church and you're just like, you know, like going down a different aisle to a skin, that's weird. That's a weird thing to do. You understand it? Like, there's a problem there. And, and I'm not saying that, like, you should feel bad or anything like that, but ask God to give you a love for your fellow believer that goes beyond everything else. Ask him. Sow to that. Uh, people use this sowing thing really incorrectly all the time. If you're watching television and they're telling you to sow a gift so you just turn the channel, I promise you, he's not talking about money here. It's talking about your life, what you give. I mean, that can be money, but that's not the, the end all be all. Ask him to give us a love for one another. Ask him to help us to forgive those that have offended us. If there's something you're holding on to from years ago, quickly forgive. Quickly seek forgiveness. And then going forward, keep quick and short accounts with people. Love one another. Overlook things. Take care of one another. That's what this is about. It's supposed to be this thing that is entirely different than everything else that's going on in this world. Let's make it that. Let's pray.